coming along. I, I think this is quite a good initiative, actually, because um, order members are so different to actually hear from a different order member each week uh, is, is going to give you a, a pretty good sense of the diversity of the order at the very least. Um, but our brief was, uh, there were these questions that I was sent and it was uh, whether I'd be willing to talk about what does it mean to have a life in the order? Why might someone choose to be ordained? Or how does being in the order shape a person's life? So I suppose I've chosen um, to focus on the second question. Why, well, more specifically, why did I choose to train for ordination? Why would I choose to train, train for ordination into Tree Ratna Order? So um, I plan to talk for about 35 minutes or so and then leave some time for questions. And um, if we do have time for questions, I'd really you encourage to ask me anything. No holds barred, just anything you want to know about anything I've said or anything about the order. So my working title is why did I decide to join the order? So for those that have never met me, um, I'm Maitri Pala and um, a bit of very brief background is that I came across the Tree Ratna community and even my first um, contact with Buddhist meditation was 30 years ago um, after I divorced and I went looking to learn meditation mainly for uh, becoming karma. Uh, I, was, I had three daughters and I was a primary school teacher, full time, so very busy, but fulfilling um, a role I had in my job. But yeah, I, I initially just wanted to sort of learn uh, to get a little bit more stillness in my life. I certainly didn't know anything about ordination at that point. So I lived in for many years in Emerald um, in the Dandenong Ranges and helped run activities up there at the water centre there when it existed. Uh, I was ordained 20 years ago in Tuscany and for a short while I worked overseas at T. Ratna Loka, a retreat centre we have in Wales. So that's a very brief history. Um, I'm currently now 64 and my family, including my elderly parents, my daughters and my eight grandchildren are very important in my life, a very um, delightful, uh, sometimes stressful and, and lots of adjectives part of my life, but very important, um, uh, my connections with them. I get a lot of joy out of my connection with family. I'm also engaged full time in activities for True Ratna, um, largely helping women to train for ordination and helping with projects wherever I can be useful. Um, so I no longer work in schools. <coughs> when I started to practice Buddhist meditation 30 years ago, um, I did find I was re a reasonably natural meditator. Um, and I particularly took to the Metta Bahavna practice, our loving kindness practice. And I'd say that's been a both a samatha and an insight practice for me over 20 years. And I've really, it's almost a bit embarrassing to say this, but I really only have just begun to get to grips with uh, mindfulness practice and the, the depths that you can tap with mindfulness practice in probably about the last five years as I've explored the Satipatthana practice in particular. So um, throughout my Buddhist life, I've been uh, fortunate to be reasonably self-motivated in finding and following my dharmic threads of inspiration. This was largely, I think, because um, there was evidence as I you know, learned about the teachings and started to put some of them into practice that these practices were indeed changing me and Obviously, I was very happy with those changes as they unfolded. Um, so I found uh, the evidence of change in me was sort of enough to keep me really interested and uh, exploring new threads and, and uh, putting in the effort, because it is a practice, so it does take effort, um, putting in the effort to keep trying to um, discover as much as I could about um, you know, the potential of these teachings. So 
So I engaged in many of the activities and teachings that um, the Tri Tri Ratna community was the Western Buddhist order then, but the Tree Ratna community had on offer. So I was fairly active, um, listening to Dharma talks, reading suggested books, um, buying Buddhist books, engaging in uh, devotional rituals like pujas, going on group and solitary retreats, and joining in studying the Dharma uh, as outlined by our teacher, Sangharakshita. So I was fairly active in taking up what was on offer. So I could have just kept doing that. Uh, why did I take another step and join the order? I could have well kept growing and uh, learning more just by doing what I was doing. So there are three jewels in Buddhism. Um, you may have heard of them if you've been coming along for a while, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And I was very inspired by and very comfortable with the first two, uh, the Buddha and the Dharma. Uh, but initially, however, I really just tolerated the third jewel, the Sangha. And uh, this is, you know, this is a perspective I have looking back. It didn't particularly feel like that at the time. But um, I was keeping the Sangha at distance in a particular way. Uh, I felt I was fairly happy with my life, my friends, my family, and I really just needed the Dharma. Um, you know, I met very, you know, lovely people. Uh, it wasn't that. It was just that I didn't really uh, know what the jewel of the Sangha was really about. But over time, I did meet um, a particular number of order members that I was re that was really intrigued by them as um, human beings. <laughs> um, perhaps sometimes a little bit wary of, but intrigued. Uh, they were order members in our order. And one in particular, her name was Ratna Dharani. She was a UK order member. In fact, she's now chair of our College of Public Preceptors. And there was something about her as a human being that, that really made me wake up and take a bit more notice of the people that were involved in this Buddhist community, rather than just sort of keep my focus on the teachings. Um, I had never met anyone quite like her. Um, and to me, she seemed like quite uh, such an impressive individual without the usual accompanying ego defence often found in individualists. So she seemed to know herself, but also be really connected to and see other people clearly. Um, I later learnt about our teacher, Banti's teaching on the true individual, which I won't go into here, but that's been actually a pivotal teaching for me about uh, working out with a you're sort of moving towards the individualistic pole or the group, joining group pole and where true individual is in the middle of and above that. I became quite intrigued by that, that, you know, did everyone have the potential to grow like that? So she was only out here for six months and after her six months stay, um, I went on a few retreats with her and she offered to meet up and I, I spent a little bit of time with her in that six months. And when I was, when she was leaving, she asked me to start writing to her or she offered that I could start writing to her uh, about my practice, about my difficulties, my inspirations. Uh, so I would write these initially longhand letters and then eventually email. She often didn't respond and she said that she probably wouldn't because she was actually very busy in our order um, uh, as a preceptor and leading activities. But she said she would guarantee that she would always read them. And uh, so I did feel like I was writing to her and she was listening. Um, so something happened in that relationship, I suppose, about being seen and heard um, to the depths of whatever my practice was at, at a particular time. I hadn't sort of had a friendship like that to that degree before. And especially given it was someone I was not even seeing. I didn't see her again for years. 
uh, physically. Um, but what I think uh, I can say from that point of meeting someone like that um, and others, uh, the short answer, if I had to just say one answer to why I joined the order, it could legitimately be that I'm in the order because people such as Udadasa, Di Omega, my original teachers, Malini, a mentor from New Zealand, and Ratnadharani and others um, moved me, moved towards me in friendship and consistently reflected back to me my own unrealised potential, my own unseen, unfelt potential. I felt completely seen by those people who be, went on to become my mentors. Um, this sort of relationship or friendship was sometimes really uncomfortable. And uh, as those, you know, that was really because those mentors were like mirrors that shone back not only my potential, which was a bit um, exciting, but also my rough edges, my ethical grey areas, my lack of confidence, my dodging and weaving around anything in particular that was uncomfortable when it was present. Uh, when I was with them, I just was much more aware of just how much more work I had to do. Um, they often never directly spoke of these things to me. Perhaps the only one was Marlene. She would just tell me what she saw. And uh, that, was, that could be very confronting, but mostly they didn't. Um, but by being in their company, as I said, the work I had to do uh, to become an integrated, aware individual, a true individual, or head that way, was so clearly evident to me. So I believe my capacity for growth and understanding and living out the teachings was vastly enhanced by contact with others that were further down the path than me. Um, my mentors were, as I said, mirrors. I could not avoid what needed to be transformed. Um, I couldn't ignore it or escape it. And, and these people were also interested and willing to help me, which felt like an extraordinary gift, actually. So I had no doubt about the value in the Buddha and the Dharma, Jules, as I said, but commitment to the Sangha Jewel took a lot longer for me to begin to understand and get behind. Um, I didn't feel I had much in common with many of the people at the Buddhist Centre when I first came along 30 years ago, except for a really obvious interest uh, that we all had in Buddhism and in you know, growing, reaching our potential and helping others. So 30 years ago, you know, at the Centre, I came across people who, you know, had different... Um, music preferences to me, read different sorts of books. There were many introverts, I felt, <laughs> because I felt like a pretty clumsy extrovert at the centre. Um, not many Sangha members in the early years had children or family commitments like I did. But one of them that was really important to me is here today, and that's Sanjeeva. I remember we, as Mitras, we used to huddle with Sangha Mati around the... Uh, around the tea area and talk about our, our, you know, practice in relationship to family and that felt very supportive. But overall in the early years, engaging with Sangha initially was a bit uncomfortable for me. So I suppose there wasn't an immediate wish to want to join something that was uncomfortable. Um, but I found that when I, was when I started to engage more fully within the Sangha and became a Mitra and started to go to study and more retreats, the spiritual community over time, uh, sorry, with the sp spiritual community, over time I noticed that um, some of my own um, working projects, my self-transformation was moving quite quickly. Um, it was an uncomfortable place. Uh, rubbing, you know, it's like sandpaper, isn't it? Rubbing up against um, things that don't feel comfortable. This process of change that I started to, um, it started to happen more quickly as I engaged with Sangamore. And it was really because you're regularly meeting with your cutting edge rather than staying on the periphery 
um, where it feels safe, but we're not quite feel fully engaged. I think I spent quite a number of years doing that, just staying out of reach of the most uncomfortable places. So I guess the first ingredients in my move to ask to train for ordination came by these offers of friendship and mentoring. They were the first uh, steps I took forward. However, I could have stayed in touch with those inspiring teachers and mentors and still not taken the step to join the order. So there was another pivotal moment in that journey for me. So one day I was reading a booklet by one of our senior teachers um, named Sabuti and it was called What is the Order? And you had sort of access to these uh, booklets and readings once you know you sort of became more at a mitra level you started exploring that a little bit more and in it I read for the first time about the first lines of the four lines of acceptance which are lines that one uh, repeats back to their preceptor at the private ordination ceremony so the first three lines of acceptance are with loyalty to my teachers I accept this ordination. In harmony with friends and companions, I accept this ordination. For the attainment of enlightenment, I accept this ordination. That, that's the first three. But it was the fourth and final line of acceptance that had a profound effect on me. It was one of those sort of sliding door moments in a way. Um, yeah, it really went deep. It was for the sake of all beings, I accept this ordination. And there was a moment, there was an epiphany at that very moment I read it. Uh, all I can say is I just knew um, that this noble goal of helping myself and all beings face life's unsatisfactoriness was something I could not do effectively alone. In that moment I knew, it was a bit like, oh, that's why I need to join the order. It was that clear. And then I had to work it out. And at times I got a bit scared about doing it and all the rest of the, the normal ego bound stuff. But it was very strong and I knew I would ask to join the order. So if I joined the order, I would become part of a community of, I think, what is now about 2,300 order members, very diverse, all through all different countries, different personalities, different um, lifestyles, um, very diverse order. But what I knew was that working together with other people similarly committed to the Buddha's teaching um, seem to increase the range and the capacity of any merit or any positive effects of my own progress within my personal practice. So whatever, uh, however much um, progress I made would be expanded in the company of others heading in the same direction. And I knew that at the moment when I read that for the sake of all beings, because the sake of all beings is such a large task to go forward to try and ease the suffering of all beings. So I just knew, oh, actually, I have to do this in a community of people who want to head in that direction too. So I discovered that this path was precious enough and valuable enough to want to want it, its effects to reach beyond what I was individual, individually capable of achieving in terms of sharing wisdom and compassion in the world. So I, I requested to train for ordination. I think I asked Dia Mega on a walk one day and she turned around and said, oh, what took you so long? <laughs> so I had, been, I had been quite a resistant mitra, I think. Um, but by asking to train for ordination, I was also asking for 2,300, it wasn't that, that many then, but it is now, friends in our community to keep being mirrors for me to keep challenging me, to keep reflecting back my potential and my areas of challenge uh, and picking me up on when I fall short of my values and goals. 
So that's what's happened. I've joined the order and, and that's what happens. Um, but there is progress also. So as much as you're mirrored back and, and that can be uncomfortable, uh, you are sort of inspired by others and your own progress to keep going. <clears throat> and along the way, some of my most significant fears that I held all this life dropped away. For instance, I was very afraid of being alone. I married very young at um, 18. <clears throat> and uh, there was a complex set of reasons in my family that I think probably led me to fear being alone. And now I love nothing more than going on a month long solitary. I so enjoy just uh, being in solitude. And I could never have imagined that 20 years ago. Uh, another example is that I would avoid taking on leadership roles in my teaching career. In fact, I think I did a leadership role once and uh, didn't get paid for the extra duties, which suited me because then I didn't have to call myself a leader. I was happy to do the work, but I didn't want to be leader. So there was a whole lot of stuff around being cautious around, about levels of responsibility, not the work, but the responsibility. I lacked confidence in my own potential and it had been easier uh, for many decades to stay safe and limited. But I joined the order and what happened? <laughs> now I have a very responsible role in the order. Uh, over the decades I've taken on more and more responsibility, um, not out of a sense of duty, but I feel I've grown big enough and clear enough uh, and brave enough to fail, um, but also to give. So it doesn't feel such a big thing now. So I'm a public preceptor. I can't quite remember how many, I think it might be about 45 public preceptors worldwide, something like that. So it's quite a responsibility in the order. And Ratnadharani was actually sent to ask me if I would consider saying yes to the role when I was living in Wales. I was really shocked. I thought she just wanted to catch up and have a cup of tea. Um, but how could I say no to the, the very person that from the beginning consistently seemed to see my growth and potential at depths well before I did? Uh, I've grown and learnt so much about myself since taking on such responsibilities. So as an order member, we take on 10 precepts. You may have chanted five uh, if you've been in our pujas. So we take on another five, a lot of them to do with speech. Um, so I've really had to focus on my ethical practice and make improvements. And um, I've found that by refining my ethical practice, which is an ongoing um, task, but it, it had a direct link to my levels of happiness and contentment. And certainly it also affected those I was around, either positively or negatively, depending on how effectively I lived the values I'd committed to following. And of course, once you're happier and more content, you tend to look up beyond your own um, limited life's needs and, and you know, burrowing away, getting them met. You know, when you're happy and content, you sort of can look outwards uh, in a much broader way and see what's needed actually and just respond. So I now had some, through the practices, through my friendships, my study, my retreats, I had uh, developed some understanding of how our samsaric our worldly world worked. Um, I started to see how things actually worked and was able to um, look at how my minds and, and my emotions were linked to my actions and behaviours. And, and also the teachings and my friends taught me how to find a gap wide enough to make choices about my behaviours and habits. That's such a wonderful point of freedom to realise you have a choice. And of course that work goes on. This is not finished by any means. Um, there's still so much to do. But I feel that I can keep working on my own development and progress at the same time. There's enough energy and uh, um, I suppose as you become more integrated, energy is released and available 
um, to do other things. So it, that work can continue while looking out and responding to the human predicament of suffering. And I, and I deeply know that all people just like me want to avoid suffering and to be happy and to experience freedom and peace. We have so much in common. So my wish is everyone's wish and uh, so empathy arises with that. So here I am, an imperfect person in an imperfect order. You only have to read our order Facebook page or see our reporting in magazine chapter to see, well, really, how, how do, do we manage to agree on anything? We're such a diverse bunch. Sometimes people think they read these reportings in and think, is that person really an order member? Um, and, of course, people might be thinking that about my reportings in as well. So the order's only 50 years old. We're still very young. And our teacher started a grand experiment to see how the teachings of the Buddha could help us in the West. Um, I like that I'm part of something that's still unfolding and that there is room for making mistakes and experimenting and having a say from the ground floor about the future potential direction of our Buddhist movement. But at, for all our differences, at some point, all order members were recognised as being effective in their commitment uh, to the value and understanding of the three jewels. We all share a commitment to try and live our lives guided by the 10 precepts and to keep practising so that we can awaken our hearts and minds to see through the causes of suffering and to do what we can to ease the suffering of others. In reality, being committed to a spiritual community like the Our Order does not guarantee that we'll always manage to live up to our agreed values and precepts. But it does mean that we, by asking to be ordained, by training for ordination and joining the Order, we are open to being challenged by our friends when our behaviour falls short of those ideals and potentially gently being mentored by our friends to make progress where it's needed. And so there is the possibility with each of us having committed to these ideals that we will at times find ourselves in a collective place of freedom, even momentarily freedom from the egos that weigh us down. And we will rise together to share a taste of clarity and unbounded love something in Buddhism that's called bodhicitta. It's experiencing the wakened heart collectively. I've had that happen. I feel I have sensed the bodhicitta arising at large, large order events, particular devotional um, rituals. When working on a common project, sometimes it's happened. And even when working with a particularly difficult situation, trying to solve um, some problems or restore harmony, I've experienced a group of order members coming together in such an inspiring way um, that, yeah, I know why I'm in the order. So heading towards finishing up, um, at these times it does feel like we are a bunch of true individuals connecting with one heart just knowing the appropriate action needed. It is a truly breathtakingly beautiful, if rare, experience. It's a glimpse of what's really possible as we journey on this Earth's surface in this lifetime. After trying to find the words to effectively explain why joining the Order turned out to be one of the best decisions I've ever made, I realise it could have been just as effective, maybe more effective, if I had have lined up a variety of my tree retina order siblings and shown a series of life flashbacks about who they once were and who they've become. Having insights into the Buddha's teachings has of course played a significant part in that transformation or that journey from who they were to who they've become. Um, for each order member, I'm sure the Buddha's teachings pivotal. But I truly believe that being part of the order 
slowly helps to reveal more polished facets of the, the Sangha jewel. Facets like friendship, encouragement, challenge, mirrors of potentiality, mentoring, shared values, shared commitment to transcendental goals, a very important one, and one you find in not many places in human society. So all of those things actually will have helped each of us move, each order member move from who we were, what we were weighed down by, uh, and our progress to where we are now. For all its imperfections and blind alleyways and uncomfortableness, we are probably still in the order because we realise there is a very good reason there are three precious jewels, not two. Thank you.